Father, we thank you tonight. We we'll bless your name for all your faithful children, leaders, workers who are here at the workers' meeting. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you empower us, energize us, so we can reach out to evangelize our communities in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, Lord, that in the house fellowship, in our communities, everywhere we minister, people will come to the Lord genuinely in Jesus' name. Amen. And you give them the real word, the right word, through your servants and through all of us, soul winners in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless us tonight and prepare us to be a blessing to other people around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we are coming to Matthew chapter 5. I was reading from verse 3 to verse 12. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Tonight, as we look at the verses before us, we want to listen to Christ, Christ's own words, as to, number one, to speak to people who are outside the kingdom. How they come in into the kingdom. The Lord wants to use you as a mouthpiece, as a soul winner, as a preacher, as a pastor, as a leader in the kingdom of God, that those who are outside, you will show them the way clearly as to how they come into the kingdom. Number two, that after we have come into the kingdom for yourself and for the people you are leading into the kingdom, how do we live the kingdom life? Now we have come from outside and we are inside. And as a children of God, as citizens of the kingdom, how do we live? Number three, as we encourage the people who have come from outside the kingdom, they have entered the kingdom, they're living in the kingdom. We don't want them to be ignorant as to the events that will happen all along the way. We're in the kingdom of God, but then we're also living in the world. And when the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God collide, when there's a collision and when there is opposition, what are the kingdom citizens or to do that is those who are in the kingdom when there's opposition contradiction and when there is persecution what are they to do then you want to assure the people who are in the kingdom the children of the of god in the kingdom what's the result as we live faithfully as kingdom citizens and we don't allow the kingdom of the world to pressurize us to come back to the kingdom of the world and we remain steadfast and we remain faithful and we remain devoted and loyal to the king of kings and the lord of lords what will be our reward here on earth and then in the proper kingdom up on high and so that's the reason we're looking at all these verses for yourself for your family for the people you are bringing to the kingdom and for those who are the disciples of the lord who are in the kingdom already and you want to help them to live the life that they ought to live a purposeful life a, a, a life that is practical and positive that they stand and they represent the king of kings here in the world we're dividing the message to three parts the message really is the blessed citizens of the heavenly kingdom the blessed citizens of the heavenly kingdom now the three points number one the practical evidence of salvation with kingdom character they come into the kingdom and we they have repented of their sins and they believe on the lord jesus christ and they're now in the kingdom what is the practical evidence that all these people were relating with were interacting with were following up that they really have the salvation or the character 
of kingdom citizens. Number two, the purifying experience of sanctification in kingdom citizens. The citizens of the kingdom, they don't just remain like they were. They become new creatures in Christ and then the word of God purifies and purges and the blood of the Lamb cleanses and sanctifies and we actually live in the kingdom and we're for the principle of what Jesus Christ taught in the Lord's Prayer that will be done here on earth as it is done in heaven. That experience we have with the Lord purifying, sanctifying as kingdom citizens. Number three, the pleasant endurance while suffering for the king's cause. Pleasant endurance while suffering for the king's cause. When you come into the kingdom, you want to defend the kingdom. You want to prolong and expand the kingdom. You want to help other people to come into the kingdom. As we're doing that, there will be persecution and there will be trials, there'll be difficulties, there'll be challenges, and then we have to endure. But you endure peacefully, and you endure painlessly, and you endure purposefully, and you endure pleasantly without fighting back and without uh, being, without using the same weapon that the people of the world, of the kingdom of the world that they are using. You are pleasant, you are peaceful in your enduring of the suffering and the persecution for the king of kings. Let's come to number one. Number one, we're looking at the practical evidence of salvation with kingdom character. Matthew chapter 5, we're reading from verse 3. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here you have a prospective person, you have a candidate for the kingdom of God. He wants to know, what will I do to enter into the kingdom of God? Probably you have told him, except a man be born again, he cannot see, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, that heavenly kingdom. And he says, what will I do? Will I pay this amount? Will I pay that amount? What will I do? Will I punish myself? Will I I pay for my sin you say no we're so poor that we cannot pay for salvation we're so poor we cannot redeem ourselves and actually the Lord is looking for the people who realize they're so poor who realize they have nothing nothing in my hand that bring only simply to the cross I cling only Jesus can save all our good works in the past, can they pay for salvation? Not at, not at all. All the good deeds we have been doing today, can they pay for salvation? Not at all. But blessed and happy and favored are the poor in spirit. They are poor in their spirit. They come before the Lord because of that poverty of spirit and they say, I have nothing to pay. It's like the parable Jesus told in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 25. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 25, and but for as much as he had not to pay, nothing to pay. That's when we come to the Lord, there is nothing we can pay for salvation because he had nothing to pay. His Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had, that payment should be made. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, it tells us there, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. That is how we have salvation. We're so poor, we don't have anything we can pay, and we come to the Lord and He redeems us, He changes our lives. You remember the next the other parable that Jesus told two men came to the temple. One a Pharisee and the other one a publican. The Pharisee said, Here I come. You know me, Lord. I pay my tithe. 
I do this, I do that, and I'm not an extortioner. I'm not like this a publican. He went back to his house without recognition from heaven and without forgiveness and without salvation. But the other one that came, the publican, that said, Be merciful unto me, a sinner. He was forgiven. He had nothing to pay and he confessed his poverty. That's how we have salvation. We're looking at, at Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 6. In Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, when we were yet without any ability, when we were yet without anything to pay for salvation, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As we are talking to sinners and they want to come into the kingdom and we want them to come into the kingdom, there is no time to waste and there is nothing they are doing. I'm not ready yet. I want to turn over a new leaf. That will not pay for your salvation. I want to become a better person. That will not pay for your salvation. I want to start coming to church. That will not pay for your salvation. I've not been reading my Bible. I want to start reading the Bible that will not pay for salvation God saves us at the point he meets us at the point we turn away from our sin and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we confess nothing in my hand I bring and the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus will avail for such people blessed at the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven immediately you believe like that you are accepted you are received into the kingdom of heaven but you know a christian character or the character of the citizen of the kingdom does not stop there we we'll come to matthew chapter 5 we're reading from verse 4 matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 4 blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. When you talk of mourning, it's when somebody had died. That's when you talk about mourning. Now, if a neighbor has died, if a loved one has died, there is place for mourning. And you say, blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. But now he's not talking about the mourning in the physical, in the natural. He's talking about spiritual things. You come into the kingdom and then you just realize you were dead in your sins and trespasses. And as you come and you want to come alive, you mourn, you are sorry for the sins you committed that put you to death because it says the soul that that sinneth it shall die and when the spirit of god convicts you and brings to the realization that you have sinned and the death penalty is upon you you mourn and then the word of god says he will be comforted when you mourn because you have sinned when you mourn you are contrite you are humble because of the sin you have committed then you are restored into the favor of God. That can happen to somebody who never knew the Lord before. He just comes to realize that he's a great sinner and the death penalty is upon him. He mourns. That can happen to a backslider. A backslider who had been with the Lord like Peter was with the Lord and eventually he backslid he told a lie and said he didn't know the Lord and when the Lord looked at him then he realized that he had gone astray he came morning and he went bitterly and he was comforted when Christ rose he said go tell Peter and that and my disciples that they meet me in Galilee. Let's look at uh, Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, it tells us, reading from verse 1, Psalm 51, verse 1, here is uh, the prayer that David prayed after he had gone into a defiled life, an immoral life, into an adulterous life. 
and he now realized what had happened and he realized what he had lost and because life eternal life spiritual and life exciting life he used to have in the lord all that was gone he mourned blessed a day that mourn for they shall be comforted have mercy upon me O god according to thy loving kindness according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my transgressions he said i'm coming not on the basis of marriage i am coming because i have sinned and i need your mercy look at verse 2 in verse 2 he says wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity he took a possession of the iniquity and he accepted he was the one that went wrong and that was uh, claiming responsibility i did it i can't say somebody pushed me to do it somebody pushed me to say it it was my sin and it was my fault it was my iniquity wash me lord and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity cleanse me from my sin in verse 3 it tells us for i acknowledge my transgression that's what a sinner have to, has to do the sinner has to acknowledge it's my transgression it's my evil it's my iniquity and because he mourns in the right way that's how the lord will accept him and my sin is ever before me he says i can see the scenery i can see the situation i can see where i blew it and i know i'm guilty i know i'm wrong a person like this who confesses will not stay long in that confession conversion will come restoration will come it tells us in verse 4 and it says in verse 4 against thee and thee only have i sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judges in verse 5 he now goes to the root and the origin of the problem behold i was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me look at verse 17 in verse 17 he now tells us the sacrifices of god are a broken spirit that's why a sinner naturally will mourn a backslider naturally will mourn he says because the sacrifice the lord is looking for is not for him to go and kill himself or die on the cross it's not for him to shed his blood christ has done that and because christ has done that the way you accept that sacrifice to be yours is that you realize it's your sin that nailed him on the cross it's your sin that made him to suffer and the sacrifices of god a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart of god thou wilt not despise blessed are they that mourn because they will be comforted we're looking at matthew chapter 26 verse 75 in matthew chapter 26 verse 75 this is talking about peter you know the story about peter you know what had happened and then when it says and peter remembered the word of jesus peter remembered the word of jesus what did he remember that will betray me what did he remember anyone who denies me before men i will deny him before my father in heaven anyone who is ashamed of me in this adulterous generation i'll be ashamed of him when i come into the kingdom and peter remembered the word of jesus which said unto him before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice and he went out he led the company of people that made him to compromise he led the the place where he feared the the face of the people and the fear made him to compromise and to tell a lie and to deny the lord he led that place it's the place of backsliding it's the place of death and it's the place of a great spiritual accident and because 
because of that he left the place if you're going to show that you really regret and you have remorse and you have repentance for the sin you committed and for the evil you did that made you to backslide there will be movement you will move out of that place you will not continue in that place you will show the lord you regret being there you regret doing that sin and you repent of that and you come out of that and then you wept bitterly he wept bitterly now you understand there are many kinds of weeping there is hypocritical weeping just to convince uh, maybe somebody uh, about uh, how sorry you are how terrible the situation is but it's not coming from your heart it is not from a broken heart it is not from a sense of contrition that have done evil and because of this evil i deserve the verdict of the lord i denied him he will deny me if you don't have that conviction and just cry 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 uh, to, you know they call it crocodile tears whatever they call it if it is that kind of tears it's not acceptable in the sight of the lord it's like the people in the days of Christ that uh, you know a, a, a girl of 12 years of age had died and then Jesus said uh, he was coming there and when he got there they were weeping and crying uh, and he said why are you making this uh, much ado the girl is not um, is not a uh, dead is asleep and I'm going to wake him up and wake her up and the people turned from that weeping to laughing uh, immediately that kind of of traditional crime that kind of religious crime that kind of cultural crime that kind of hypocritical crying is not mourning in the sight of God look at Malachi chapter 2 we're looking at verse 13 Malachi chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 13 so you will see how God regards that kind of crying and this have ye done again covering the altar of the lord with tears look at that and god says I, I know the kind of tears you have cultural crime traditional crime and hypocritical crime and religious crime it says this you have done again covering the altar of the lord with tears with weeping and with crying out in so much that he regardeth not the offering anymore and receiveth it nor receiveth it with good will at your hand morning should be genuine that you really feel sorry deeply sorry that you have gone astray and now in repentance you are coming back let's come back to matthew chapter 5 we're reading from verse 5 after you have shown your poverty of spirit and your contrition and the fact that you have nothing to pay for salvation and after you have shown that you are sorry you caused the death of Christ it, your, it was your sin that nailed him to the cross it was your sin that made him to come through this uh, world and suffer everything that he suffered and you realize you are responsible nailing him to the cross and you mourn and the comfort of conversion and the comfort of salvation and the comfort of a new life and the comfort of being forgiven and received into the kingdom of God has now come to you then it, something is going to follow in Matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 5 blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth after you are forgiven you are lowly you are not going about as safe i'm an angel i've never seen that this is who i am i've been living the heavenly life and the righteous life and the holy life since i was born not at all you're so grateful to god were it not for the sacrifice of christ where would i be 
Were it not for the forgiveness and freedom Christ has given, where will I be? When you hear that another person has done something sinful and something foolish, you are not bragging and saying, how could they do that? Me, I can never do that. You are meek and you are lowly and you are humble because, you know, it is grace that has brought you thus far. And you are not looking up, down upon other sinners, on the sinners you are witnessing to, as if they are so bad, you are meek and you are lowly, because it is grace that has pardoned you, and it is the free gift of God that has given you salvation. Because of that, your life is humble, your life is meek, and your life is lowly. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It tells us in James chapter 1, reading from verse 21. James chapter 1, reading from verse 1. Wherefore lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. After you are born again, you love the word of God, the engrafted word. Word. When you hear the word, you pray, Lord, write it on my heart, write it on my conscience, write it on the table of my heart so that I will not forget. You confess before the Lord, I, I often forget, I soon forget, but Lord, I come with the lowliness, I come with meekness, and I'm receiving the word, the engrafted word that will be able to keep me saved. That's the attitude of a child of God. You have been born again, and now after that new birth in the Lord, you remain meek. It tells us in First Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 15. First Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 15. And it tells us, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Exalt the Lord God in your heart. Put in a special place the Lord God in your heart. Separate, set apart the Lord God in your heart. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Somebody comes to ask you, you appear sure you are going to heaven. And you appear sure that if the rapture takes place, you are going to go in the rapture. What's your response to that? What's your answer to that? Your answer is not, uh, you know, an answer of bragging, yes, I'm going to heaven. If anybody in this community gets to heaven, I will be that one. If nobody else gets there, I am getting there because I know myself. I know the life I live. I'm righteous, I'm holy, I'm rapturable, and because of that, I'm going. It says, no, that's not the attitude. Don't forget it is grace that brought you out of the kingdom of darkness and brought you into the kingdom of his dear son you didn't pay anything and even to remain saved and to remain on the narrow way that leads to heaven it is all of grace because of that you answer with gentleness not bragging not boasting you answer with meekness and with trembling and with reverence to god and with fear and now the meekness when you handle other people when you deal with other people he is going to the kingdom i am going into the kingdom he is expecting the coming of the lord i'm expecting the coming of the lord and then we're moving on i move on in relationship to my brother in relationship to my sister with meekness knowing that we're not there yet we're just on our way and therefore in our relationship as kingdom citizens having Christ, having kingdom character with the evidence of salvation practical evidence of salvation there is that meekness and lowliness we're looking at colossians chapter 3 in colossians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 12 colossians chapter 3 verse 12 therefore put on as the elect of God holy and beloved 
bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. Put it on. Let that be your, your clothes that you wear, that humility is there. You are not on your way in the kingdom of God, trampling down on everybody, pushing everybody down, and then being so energetic and so powerful, you're militant, and everybody has to clear out of the way for you. If you are saved by grace, if you are standing by grace, and if you are grateful for the grace of God that has appeared, unto you you treat other people with mercy with kindness with humbleness of mind with meekness and long suffering let's come to point number two now in point number two the purifying experience of sanctification in kingdom citizens in the message of the lord jesus christ in matthew chapter 5 looking at this first part of the Sermon on the Mount, we see that Christ expects us to make progress. He, he tells us we must be poor in spirit, but we don't stand there, we don't stay there. We must mourn if there had been sin, either in your personal life or in the life of a dear one who is back living and is dead spiritually, and you are mourning for them, and then we're making progress, we're meek, and we're gentle, and we're lowly. He wants us to be checking up our Christian lives, our Christian comportment, and be checking up, do I have that poverty of spirit? Do I have that morning when something spiritually has gone wrong, either deliberately or accidentally, or because I, I made myself a coward and therefore I denied the Lord? There must be that morning. And then we quickly make sure we are washed again in the blood of the Lamb. And after that forgiveness, do I come out of my prayer chamber as if nothing had happened and I am the strong one, I never miss it am i meek am i lowly am i gentle am i humble in the christian life and then do i move on moving upwards it tells us in matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 6 matthew chapter 5 verse 6 blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled it says in the christian life we never get static or stagnant or satisfied i've got enough you, you find uh, there are people who say i'm saved i'm forever saved are they panting for anything are they pursuing anything are they having the goal of uh, going higher and reaching higher or going deeper in the lord nothing at all are they thirsty about anything are they thirsty about the righteousness of god what do you say the righteousness of christ is mine already and he has imparted he has imputed his righteousness unto me so why worry and why bother about righteousness now christ himself our savior who does not want us to be static or stagnant staying in one place uh, just uh, referring to historical testimony 19 such and so 2000 and such and such i became saved and that is all it says we must move on blessed a day which hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled he has promised to us a kind of righteousness greater and higher than the initial righteousness he has promised us something that is greater than the righteousness of the first day of our conversion is giving us the privilege and the fulfillment of the promise and prophecy that a higher righteousness the righteousness of faith and the righteousness of the faithful should be ours it tells us in luke chapter 1 reading from verse 72 luke chapter 1 reading from verse 72 it tells us as he makes us look up to the fact that what we have got is not enough that he has promised another level a higher level of 
righteousness to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant in verse 73 it says the oath which is where to our father abraham verse 74 look at what he says he will do that he would grant us he will grant unto us he will grant unto you he will grant unto me he will grant unto us that we have been delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear when he does that you know you're already a christian you are born again you're a kingdom citizen and then there are steps you need to take there are things you ought to do but there are times fear can hold you back it may be fear of the road that can hold people back it may be fear of the economy that can hold us back it may be fear of a disease or pandemic that can hold some people back it may be fear of the devil of demons that can hold some people back it may be fear of joblessness that may hold people back if i take my stand and if i do that what will happen how will people react to me the fear of man may hold you back but he says you should thirst and be hungry for the righteousness that he will give you there will be no fear in your heart at all he will deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies that will serve god without fear i was waiting for a good amen, amen. And look at what will happen in verse 75. It says in verse 75, in holiness and righteousness, hold on there, fear decreases holiness and righteousness. Fear makes you to live less than the provision of holiness and righteousness that the Lord has given. The place you ought to go to demonstrate the righteousness of Christ and your commitment to that holy life, that place you cannot go there if there are things on the way you are, you are afraid of. Fear fear of man fear of circumstances and fear of the future and fear of persecutors and fear of what people will do and what people will say will make you have less holiness and less righteousness and if uh, you know you are free today and then you go less you cannot openly demonstrate the holiness and the righteousness that god wants you to demonstrate and tomorrow and tomorrow and the other day what is uh, going less and less and less a little at a time a little drop of water is out of uh, that bucket a little drop of water is out a little drop a little drop eventually everything will leak away eventually there'll be no holiness or righteousness but blessed a day that are thirsty after righteousness and they're so thirsty they don't fear anything in the way of them getting that higher righteousness they delivered from the fear of man and fear of circumstances and then you are able to serve the Lord in holiness and righteousness before him you come to a stage in your life where what anybody says does not matter what anybody does does not matter how anybody feels about your life about what you're doing does not matter how anybody reacts to what you're doing does not matter all you are concerned about is what does God think about this how will God reward this how will God evaluate this now all that you are concerned about is holiness and righteousness before him all the days of your life and if you are thirsty for that the Lord will grant it to you look at uh, matthew chapter 5 verse 8 now in matthew chapter 5 we're reading from verse 8 it says blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god it's uh, going beyond the uh, life we had at salvation 
is now going into the inner recesses of the heart you see jesus christ jesus christ does not limit the provision of his grace to only salvation 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 and then it doesn't uh, a limit uh, is uh, is transforming work in our lives to the outward outward appearance i don't uh, steal i don't commit adultery i dress well and everything we're referring to people can see on the outside it's talking about now what people cannot see because men look at the outward appearance but god looks at the heart and jesus said after you have cleaned up the outside of the cup after you have cleared up the outside of your life after everything on the outside has been all right and has been clean before men now the heart <clears throat> the inner man must have that purity purity of thought and purity of mind and purity of spirit and purity of purpose and purity of motive and purity of intention that inner purity after you are saved the lord jesus christ expects that you will passionately desire that the lord himself will so purify your heart and you'll have the privilege of seeing god on the final day that's why he said blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god you must be asking yourself then the people that go about in life and they pollute their own conscience and they defile their own heart outwardly they don't go into adultery they don't go into fornication but the pornographic things they voluntarily personally look at in the privacy of their chamber pollutes their heart and it pollutes their thinking and it pollutes their vision how those people will see the lord that's going to be very doubtful because jesus said the people that will see god blessed and happy and favored and fortunate at the pure in heart for they shall see god as you are then looking up to the lord and you know that the rapture can happen at any time you will not throw away your life into the mud and throw away your life into inner defilement you will go to the lord and say lord this sanctification this purity of heart i want to possess i want to experience and i want it to continue forever blessed at the pure in heart for they shall see god in psalm 24 we're reading from verse 3 psalm 24 we're reading from verse 3 it tells us in psalm 24 verse 3 who shall ascend into the hill of the lord or who shall stand in his holy place look at the answer coming directly from the word of god it says he that has clean hands the salvation when you are saved, your hands are clean. You say like Zacchaeus, half of my goods I give to the poor. If you have been stingy, you open your hand to the help and to the sustainers of the poor. And if I've taken anything from any man by wrong accusation, I restore him fourfold. Your hands are now clean. You don't have stolen property in your house anymore. You don't have stolen certificate. You are working with with anymore your hands are now clean but then you go beyond that initial experience of salvation and you want a pure heart because the answer to the question who will go to the hill of the lord who will stand in his holy place they're the people that have clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully and that happens when you come back to the lord and you want him to cleanse your heart purge your heart purify your heart 
and you believe the same faith you had at the point of salvation that same faith you now have at this point of sanctification the purifying of the heart acts of the apostles chapter 15 we're looking at verse 9 Acts chapter 15, reading from verse 9, and he put no difference between us and them. He put no difference between us, the apostles, the Jews, and the house of Cornelius, the Gentiles. The same experience we had when Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. The same experience they had in the house of Cornelius. They were saved, they were sanctified, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. He is the one that purifies their heart. And we are the ones that stretch out our hands of faith and receive from the Lord. It tells us in First John, sorry, in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25, what he does, how he purifies us, how he sanctifies us, husbands, love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it what did he give himself what did he sacrifice on the cross of calvary number one for the salvation of all sinners but now he's talking about us he's talking about about the believers he now does this for us who are children of god verse 26 it says in verse 26 that he might sanctify he he sanctifies that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word verse 27 and then it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church that he might present the sanctified church the purified church the church that is made holy holy in heart holy in the mind holy in motive holy in influence holy from within that he might present that church glorious not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish let's come back to matthew chapter 5 matthew chapter 5 and here we're looking at verses 7 and 9 you see when we get saved we mourn if there's any sin, if there's any backsliding, then we are comforted with the reassuring grace and forgiveness of God. That makes us lowly, that makes us meek, that makes us kind, that makes us merciful. Now, we come to the next experience. We thirst after righteousness and it fills us with righteousness without leaving any vacant, empty place in our heart for any form of unrighteousness. And then we believe in the Lord and purifies our heart by faith. There is going to be a consequence and it says, Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. After you have obtained grace from God, after you have obtained forgiveness from God, after you have obtained comfort from God, after you have obtained deep experiences from God, you are so grateful to God and you know that it was not by marriage the people around you you will say what can i how can i show my gratitude to god by being merciful unto them you're not going to find uh, somebody who had just received grace and god was merciful to him uh, and then he sees his neighbor maybe his wife or maybe her husband and then uh, she he or she will be kind of a uh, brutal and all you can't do that you are conscious of the grace you have received and you are conscious 
of the mercy of God and because of that if your hand is strong before to box now the hand is weakened grace has weakened the hand if your tongue was sharp before grace has softened the tongue if your uh, kind of movement was a kind of a brutish and brutal and uh, bullying other people before now life is different you are so grateful to God and you are mindful of what God has given you that every time now you want to be merciful it says blessed at the merciful for they shall obtain mercy look at verse 9 in verse 9 blessed are the peacemakers blessed are the peacemakers when the prince of peace comes to reign in your heart you're not pugnacious anymore you're not the fighting type anymore you're not looking for violent things and you know you want to make people provoke people make people angry and make people forget themselves you want uh, somebody to come out if he has the strength to come and fight you you know when christ comes into your heart and is the prince of peace now you are a peacemaker there's been reaped of conflict between you and your wife and you are been saying i will not budge i'm the head of this house if that woman will not bow and submit whatever will happen will scatter everything now you are saved now you are sanctified and the prince of peace is reigning in your heart blessed at the peacemakers if you are working in a company in an institution and then you are being meeting with other workers after office hours and you're saying what are we going to do we need to teach all these people they call themselves master or boss or director we're going to teach them lesson there's going to be a mutiny and they will be surprised we'll spring it from here and spring it from there now you have the grace of god in your heart now you are born again now you are sanctified and the prince of peace dwells in your heart he reigns supreme without a rival you now become a peacemaker all the people you have been conniving with before and you have been having conspiracy conspiring with we're going to do it this way and we're going to do it that way you now go to them because the peace of god is now reigning in your heart and jesus said when you do that blessed and happy and fortunate and favored and the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God if the peacemakers are called the children of God what will troublemakers be called the troublemakers cannot be called by the same name what are conspirators going to be called the conspirators cannot be called by the same name if the peacemakers shall be called the children of god the people who tear houses apart and the people who separate and divorce go your way i go my way we cannot live together we're not compatible you are saved i'm saved we're not compatible you say you are sanctified i say i'm sanctified we're not compatible compatible if the people of a god if the children of god are the peacemakers the people who cannot stay together they cannot mend fences together and they cannot forget their differences and be at peace what shall they be called they'll be called the children of the devil because he was a murderer from the beginning and he is the one that lost violence and conspiracy and tearing apart the evidence that we are saved and the evidence that our hearts are pure and the evidence we are waiting for the coming of the Lord is that anywhere we find ourselves, our influence on people around us will bring peace, will bring unity. The influence we have on people who are violent and they're like volcanoes, they want to erupt. When you get there, the Lord will use you to influence them to come down and to be united and to be at peace one with the other blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God will be children of God in Jesus name
We're looking at James chapter 3 verse 14. James chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 14. It tells us, it says, but if ye have bitter envy and strife in your heart, that's not a pure heart. If ye have bitter envy and strife in your heart, that's not a purified, sanctified heart. If ye have a bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. In verse 15, it says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Now, in verse 16, it says, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But verse 17 tells us, and it says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. The wisdom from above is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. In verse 18, in verse 18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace, them that make peace, them that make peace. In Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 17, Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. That's the evidence of being born again. That's the evidence of having Christ in our heart. That's the experience that we thirsted and we hungered after righteousness and we're now filled with righteousness. That's the evidence that faith has taken the blood of the Lamb, has cleansed our heart, purified our heart, and now blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those people who are purified in their heart, they don't recompense evil for evil. He did that to me, I show him. He threw that at me, I show him as I have something stronger and something uh, more terrible to throw back at him. Children of God, those who have Christ living in their heart and Christ reigns in their heart, they recompense to no man, no man, evil for evil. They provide things honest in the sight of all men. In verse 18, it says, if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, remember, in our house fellowship, we're talking to house fellowship members and we're letting the members know that this is the life of a child of God. And we are allowing them to compare the word of God with their lives. And you yourself, the teacher and the leader in the house fellowship as a worker, before you go to take the passage to the people in the house fellowship, you want to match the word with your own life. How is your relationship with your wife? Your relationship with your husband? Your relationship with your children? Are you a man of peace? Are you a woman of peace? Or are you looking, are you always looking at uh, putting something to make your husband stumble? Or doing something, saying something to provoke your wife and make her stumble? I want to test her whether she still is, uh, you know, that angry personality uh, as yet. Or after all these, uh, Bible studies, are you a person that will deliberately test other people's endurance and say, I'm just testing them? If you're like that, how qualified are you? If you're not a peacemaker, to go and help other people to become peacemakers, you must recognize that in your life. The word must work in you first. And it is when the word has worked mightily in you, you can then take that word as the transforming weapon transforming instrument that you take to other people that will help them and then you can quote confidently if it be possible as much as life in you live peaceably with all men with your masters with your bosses with your directors with your co-workers with the junior with anybody in church and outside the church live 
peaceably with all men. We're coming to point number three now. In point number three, the pleasant endurance while suffering for the king's cause. Number one, we need to understand that if you are in the king's cause, that is, you have a project and it is for the king and you have a ministry and it is for the king already before you go into the ministry you kneel down and you pray and you say lord i thank you for giving me a ministry that you would have been doing if you were here on earth and therefore as you have given me this privilege to bring people into the kingdom and to make them live the kingdom life i'm going to stay i'm going to stand i'm going to do it with all my strength with all my wisdom and with everything all the skill that i have you settle that to start with you consecrate for that to start with before you get to the field already you have said whatever i meet on the way whatever i see in the way it will not matter at all i am going to defend the king's cause i'm going to uplift the king's cause i'm going to extend expand the king's kingdom i'm going to do everything to make sure that i am living for the kingdom now when you now get to the field and you're doing the work that you have committed yourself you're going to do you don't forget that you are there to do something for the kingdom and whatever will happen conflict persecution suffering you are ready for that and you are going to endure not that you endure in a way that you are gritting your teeth and you are saying why it not for uh, the kingdom why it not for the gospel i wouldn't be going through this i know what my mates are doing outside i know what i would have been uh, why it not for this or that how would i be here now enduring all this you endure pleasantly you endure peacefully you endure without fighting back because everything is for the lord's sake let's come back now to matthew chapter 5 we're reading from verse 10 matthew chapter 5 verse 10 blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven underline those words for righteousness sake you have thirsted after righteousness and it has filled you with righteousness you have hungered for righteousness and you have said the most important thing i want on earth above food beyond certificate beyond money beyond recognition beyond position beyond anything on earth what i want is righteousness righteousness in me righteousness in the people around me all i want to see is a world that flows with righteousness well if that is your desire if that is your goal blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake nothing good can turn out without somebody sweating without somebody suffering without somebody being misunderstood without somebody being opposed if you're going to have righteousness and you're not going to flow with the stream of the world if you're going to make a mark and if you're going to make a difference in your community and in the world if you're going to make a mark there are people that do not understand righteousness they do not want to pay the price of sending denial for righteousness and you say i'm going to stand for the lord there was a Matthew luda that that stood for the kingdom of god there was a john wesley that stood for holiness without which no man shall save the lord there were people like paul the apostle that stood very firm like jude earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints 
they didn't find it easy and if they did it at their own time in your own time you'll do it in jesus name you'll be slandered but you'll keep on you'll be opposed but you'll keep on there'll be pressure against your life but you'll keep on they'll call you madam holy holy but you'll keep on they'll call you pastor perfection but you'll keep on they'll call you names that's the persecution and blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven ours will be the kingdom in jesus name Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're reading from verse 12. It says, Ye, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All in any age, any generation, any dispensation, any community, anyone that will be different different from everybody around and different from the people that live the regular life the worldly life the normal life and the insipid life and the life that nobody is going they're not even going to notice any difference but anybody that is going to make a difference a difference in righteousness a difference in holiness and is going to be a preacher of holiness and is going to practice the holiness he preaches and is going to do that without looking at anybody's face he's going to do that all the time and he's going to do that confidently without shrinking back because so and so is there anyone like that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution well as civilization comes and then people have the light of education and they are enlightened well things change look at verse 13 in verse 13 it says but evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse the more uh, civilization they have the more evil they're able to do the more gadgets and things they have the more evil because now it becomes easier for them to do the evil but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived look at verse 14 in verse 14 but continue thou but continue thou remember it's not on the field you're making your consecration you had made your consecration before going out of the church building before going out of the sanctuary before going out into the ministry before going out of your prayer chamber and so it is not when you get over there that you are surprised i didn't think i'll meet something like this i didn't think that this will happen you must not be surprised already you have prepared yourself already you have known and then all the prayer you need to pray that your backbone will be strengthened that your inner man will be strengthened that the power of the purifying blood of Christ will work effectively in you and that the Holy Spirit the power or the endowment of power that will embolden you encourage you and strengthen you you have got that in your inner chamber before coming out as you come out now and then you meet all those things you continue in the things which you have learned and has been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them, you will continue in Jesus' name. We're coming to Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Acts chapter 14, reading from verse 22. Here we're told, Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples. You are now, you are not just a sinner outside now. You have come into the kingdom and you are a disciple of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom. Your soul is confirmed by the clear teaching of the word of God, exhorting them to continue in the faith. Continue you in the faith and that we must we must just like we must be born again we must now through tribulation much persecution enter into the kingdom of god i will enter 
I said I will enter. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. We're reading from verse 11. Matthew chapter 5. We're reading from verse 11. It says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. When men shall revile you. Uh, you understand uh, when we were young at school uh, the children would say i even prefer the the uh, whip me with a stick than call me a bad name than say things about me i never knew anything about you know the same thing with us adults when they revile you when they belittle you and when they call your names and when they say something that you know is unheard of a big lie that they told against you they revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely they might say it in a locality they might say it in a uh, with uh, something that almost anybody that reads can read it any part of the world it said all manner of evil against you and it is false and it says for my sake even then by the grace of God you will stand in Jesus name I will stand in Jesus name you will stand and you will not uh, chicken out at that time and then go out and say, I cannot endure this. I cannot go through this. The grace of God will keep you standing in Jesus' name. That's when you know the Christian, the believer, the citizen of the kingdom that has backbone and the one that is jellyfish amphibian is neither standing here or standing there. You will stand in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 6, we're reading from verse 22. In Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 22, here is what the word of God is declaring to us. He said, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, they frown at you. We don't want you here. You are the holy, holy person, and you are the one that wants to carry righteousness to far. We don't want you here. You are not in our class. We are not in your class. Go your way. And people, you know, rejection bothers them. When they're rejected from this place and this place, they cannot smile. But Jesus said, happy are you. He said, blessed are you. He said, favored are you. Rewardable are you. When men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast your name as evil for the son of man's sake look at verse 23 it says in verse 23 rejoice and you rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy that looks different from what most people do when they are reviled when they hear that something bad has been spoken or written about them and when they hear that almost everybody is looking at them as a criminal as a as, as a hypocrite and they say they are preaching holiness but look at what he has done and nobody is checking up to know whether that thing is true or not they just believe that you are a bad man you are a bad woman and then you cannot carry your head up and you are looking down because I don't know whether he has read that thing whether she has read that thing everybody looks at me now as a bad bad person but Jesus said when that thing happens and you're suffering for righteousness sake it says rejoice ye in that day leap for joy jump for joy for behold your reward is great in heaven for in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets look at verse 26 <clears throat> in verse 26 it says woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you when they will vote for you when they accept you when you say we like now is uh, now he now compromises with everybody he has realized if he's too strong if he's too straight if he's too steadfast he knows the suffering that comes out of that if it if he's too proper and he's uh, seeking after perfection he knows the injury that comes from that and now he has so he can compromise with 
with everybody now he knows it is wrong we even put him to the test or put her to the test but now everything is down and when they see you like that they will pounce on you and they will do more things that you will totally go down totally compromise you'll not trace your head and jesus said woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you for so did their fathers to the false prophets i will not be a false prophet i said i will not be a false prophet you'll not be a false prophet in jesus name Let's come to Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. In Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 12. Here is what the Lord is saying. He says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. The people who went before us, they suffered this same persecution and they stood. And that same Christ who upheld them is still alive, and God who upheld them is still at life and the holy ghost was the power of god energizing them is still the same and if we will go to god with the same faith and with the same passion and with the same desire with the same thirst and the same hunger that we say those people lived a victorious life in spite of all opposition in spite of all persecution and dispute this is my time i will stand somebody there must stand i will stand say it properly i will stand don't let satan uh, hear you saying i will stand and say i will catch him when he goes out of there he doesn't really have confidence let satan hear i will stand i will stand you will stand we shall stand our church will stand and then he says great will be our reward in heaven your reward will be great on earth your reward will be great in heaven no compromise no backsliding no looking down no running away we confront the enemy in the power of the Holy Ghost, we confront the evil doers. In the power of the Spirit of God, we confront the world and we bring the same gospel unto them. And many are going to turn to the Lord in Jesus' name. And when those um, 21st century Pharisees, when they say, did we not strictly charge you that you are not preaching this name, but now you have filled our city with your doctrine. You are going to reply then whether it's right in the presence of God or before you to answer you or to obey you rather than God, judge ye, but we will declare the truth we have heard forcefully and pungently and persuasively and perpetually all the days of our lives will stand for the truth and will keep on standing in Jesus name if that's your mind rise up and tell the Lord and say God I thank you you have called me into the kingdom I have entered into the kingdom I will stand I will stand I will stand and nothing will make me to run back from the battlefield I will do this work and many will keep on coming into the kingdom the Lord prepare you the Lord empower you and the Lord embolden you it will be done in Jesus' name.